I didn't think it possible, but Manchester United has somehow managed to steal the title of Clown Show away from PSG. I haven't talked about Manchester United since this video, so we'll start our journey in late August of 2022. After two horrendous losses to begin the campaign, it felt like there was not really any hope left for Manchester United. And then the mackerel jinx happened. Between late August to the World Cup break in mid-November, United lost just twice and climbed up to fifth. The bounce back wasn't without its drama, however. Cristiano Ronaldo, during an interview with professional clown Piers Morgan, said that he felt, quote, betrayed by Ten Hag and senior executives who wanted him to leave. He claimed that Ten Hag deliberately provoked him by leaving him on the bench against City. No, you were left on the bench because you went scoreless in the three appearances prior. He also accused the club of doubting him about the illness of his daughter, which led him to miss preseason. And then he went on to criticize the facilities at the club, adding the owners did not care about the club and that United was a quote, marketing club. The explosive incident led Manchester United and Cristiano Ronaldo agreeing to part ways. By the way guys, quick reminder once again, I am trying to hit 200k before the end of the year and if we do, I will give you San Marino episode 2. Like I said, and I know you all agree with me, you love to see me in pain, so if you want to see it, then, get me to 200k. Nevertheless, United carried on their great form, and Marcus Rashford turned on the Nitro. Throughout the rest of the season, he found some of the best form of his career, scoring 13 league goals. He also scored an all but one fixture in United's FA Cup run, and helped the Red Devils win their first piece of silverware in six years. Another huge component to United's turnaround was Casemiro. After being signed before the end of the summer window in 2022, he became a crucial element of United's midfield. Casemiro even scored some important goals, including one in the FA Cup final. At the end of the season, Manchester United finished third, and with Eric Ten Hag slowly creating an identity, there was a lot of things to look forward to at the club. Just ignore that. Going into this season, Eric Ten Hag wanted to build upon last campaign's success with some new signings to fill in positions of need and to deepen the squad. Christian Eriksen was great for the Red Devils, but to cut him some slack, the club wanted to acquire a new attacking midfielder. Mason Mount had looked awful for Chelsea last season, and that was enough for the club to entirely give up on him. That didn't stop United, though, from paying $64.2 million for his services. Honestly, I think 12-year-old kids who base their opinions on FIFA ratings could match the market better than this. Next on the checklist was a new keeper, especially after David De Gea's disastrous season in 2022-23. The keeper had four errors leading to a goal last season, the joint most of anyone else in the league. To replace him, Man United huffed up $52.5 to bring in Andre Onana. Onana was one of the best performing keepers last season with Inter and helped the club reach an unlikely Champions League final. Lord knows how Anthony Martial has stayed at the club this long but United knew they needed someone new to start up top. So they turned to 20-year-old Rasmus Hoyland for 75 million. Hoyland is incredibly raw, but to Ten Hag, the striker's profile fits the system. United then strengthened their midfield even more with the loan signing of center midfielder Sofian Amrabat. The midfielder can provide the team with an extra lung or two, and there's an option to buy him. The club also brought in 35-year-old defender Johnny Evans as a sort of Fergie-era mentor. You may have forgotten this, but Perry Maguire was supposedly on his way out. West Ham were interested, and the two parties agreed on personal terms. But because the defender received an increase in his salary as a result of United qualifying for the Champions League, he wanted $7 million from the club in order to leave. This stalled talks, West Ham grew tired of waiting, and the deal collapsed. Had this deal gone through though, Manchester United would have probably bought a better quality backup defender. Now while this was all happening, there was the Mason Greenwood ordeal. The guy had been exposed as a domestic abuser, and then United were exposed themselves for trying to bring him back with an insane plan. One that included how United would figure out what photos to take of Greenwood in training, and how Eric Ten Hag would deal with questions about Greenwood. There was even talks about getting involved with domestic abuse charities. That one obviously blew up in their faces. Wow. Responding to them being caught in 4K, United decided to backtrack and announced that Greenwood would no longer play for United. A statement from CEO Richard Arnold followed, which basically showed how spineless he was. He had been behind most of the plan, but scurried away after backlash, but still shamelessly claimed Greenwood was innocent. Again, we've seen the photos. Oh, also Greenwood released his own statement where he said he was, quote, cleared of all charges when the charges were only dropped. After that storm, though, Greenwood would be not sold, but loaned out. That's right, they're still trying. Either way, for now, he's been loaned out to Spanish club Hitafe, their social media has been an absolute garbage heap, and I sure hope the club liquidates by next week. All I'll say is, um, 
I'm very excited for December 17th. Now, not even a week later, United apologized for inviting former ladies coach Jeff Konopka to a women's Super League game. Konopka is a registered sex offender and was convicted of 19 offenses of indecent assault and gross indecency against girls aged under 16 and 14. United, in a statement, claimed that they recently received information about these convictions. Konopka was sentenced in 2011. Man United started their season with a narrow win against Wolves at home, and they were pretty fortunate to leave with all three points because this is a stonewall penalty. Manchester United then got absolutely outplayed by Spurs in their next fixture, but I will say, this was definitely a handball in the box. The following week saw the Red Devils start horrendously against Forest, but they were able to score three unanswered to complete a comeback victory. However, again, United lost to a team in North London. This time, it was an Arsenal side struggling to find the back of the net. So after four games, Manchester United found themselves 11th with yet another underwhelming beginning to the season. But with an international break before their next fixtures, it was a good opportunity to regroup and bounce back. Well, not so fast, because after the defeat to Arsenal, Jadon Sancho posted a tweet in response to Ten Hag leaving the winger out of the squad due to his performances in training. In summary, Sancho basically said he was performing at his optimal abilities in training and that whatever information was coming out was untrue. He also added that he had been a scapegoat for a long time. In response, United were immediately prepared to sell the winger to a club in Saudi Arabia or Turkey. Oh, so now you're gonna sell unwanted players. Now, how exactly did we get to this boiling point, though? It all started last season when Ten Hag and his staff were trying to get Sancho to arrive on time to training to little to no success. This wasn't anything new because at Dortmund, Sancho's attitude was put into question as well. One source said that Jaden was mentally tough on the pitch but could be quite childish and unprofessional with the little things like missing team meetings and oversleeping. It got so bad that Edith Terzic, Dortmund's assistant coach at the time, had to personally knock on Sancho's hotel room to pick him up before meetings. United were aware of this when they first signed Sancho, but they had a feeling they could improve this productivity. They even promised the number 7 shirt to him a year before he signed. Obviously, that promise was broken. Sancho initially struggled to have any influence on the game when he first signed. However, he did start to improve in the later stages of the season under Ralph Ragnick. In his last 12 league games of the 2021-22 season, he had five goal contributions. Nothing to really scream about, and if you match that with his price tag, uh, it's, it's definitely pretty underwhelming, but it, at least it's a start. Now, when Ten Hag came in the next season, Sancho improved even more. He had three goals in eight games. But then, after a match against Chelsea, the winger wouldn't make an appearance for four months straight. In the middle of that period, Sancho was sent to the Netherlands to work with coaches trusted by Ten Hag and was left out of United's training camp during the World Cup. Then, Ten Hag went public about the whole situation, saying there were issues with Sancho's mental fitness without Sancho's permission. But going back to the tweet, Sancho refused to apologize to Ten Hag, and that resulted in him being banished from the first team. Since then, the last time we saw Sancho, he was playing pro clubs with my boy John. Shout out JCC, by the way. Now, was Sancho's statement extremely foolish? Yes. Is there any doubt in my mind that he is not giving his all in training? Probably not, considering the multiple sources. But I will say, Ten Hag speaking about the whole situation in public is not helping anyone. Especially that most recent statement where he basically threw Sancho under the bus. Quick segue though, it, it doesn't really surprise me, because Eric Ten Hag it's not, not really a good person anyways. On top of how he dealt with Sancho, there was the whole thing where he was open to Greenwood's return, but again, that really shouldn't be much of a surprise itself because in May of 2022, Ten Hag backed the return of Mark Overmars at Ajax. Overmars in February of 2022 admitted to sending a series of inappropriate messages to female colleagues. Football's got a lot of role models, doesn't it? If you think the clown show ends there, it doesn't. Anthony was recently accused of domestic violence, and there's once again photographic evidence. I won't show it here, but there will be a link to an article down below. I will give you a bit of a warning. It is very graphic. Now, Anthony responded to these allegations in a TV interview where he basically said he never hit anyone, but Manchester United decided that Anthony would, quote, take time away from the club due to these accusations. Less than a month later, however, Anthony returned to training while the police are still making inquiries. They're not even done yet. Not like we're any better though. United, of course, made a statement regarding all this, probably their hundredth of the last three months. And it really said nothing, but this paragraph was pure irony. Domestic abuse? I sleep. Player complaining about being thrown under the bus? Sell him right now! Anyways, back to the clown show's performances on the pitch. After the international window, United lost three of its last five matches. They only managed wins against newly promoted Burnley and Palace in the EFL Cup, 
but ironically enough, Palace then beat them four days later. Now, after seven games played, Manchester United find themselves 10th with nine points. It's their worst start to a Premier League season ever. By the way, they've probably made more statements than had wins this season. But what exactly happened? Why, after such a good season, is United now finding themselves struggling to even stay in the top 10? One thing that should be pointed out is Manchester United won a lot of their games last season due to the margins slightly being in their favor. In 13 of their wins last season, a single goal decided the outcome. That was more than any other team in the league. Sure, those wins still give you three points like any other, but it does ignore underlying issues. One of them being the fact that despite United finishing third, they were tied seventh for the most goals scored with 58. And the difference between them and the sixth highest scorers, Newcastle, was 10 goals. This has carried over and gotten worse this season as United has the eighth worst attack having scored just seven goals. The goal scoring isn't really the issue, but more so the results of a far bigger problem. Manchester United's over-reliance on certain players. In this case, Marcus Rashford. Rashford scored more than a fourth of United's goals in the Premier League last season. It has been seen time and time again when he's in form, Manchester United's attack is at their best. The problem, however, is Rashford can be quite streaky. At points of the season, he's unstoppable, but at others, he's completely dry. And when he goes dry, so does United's attack. That hasn't been more evident than right now, as the forward has only scored once this season. Rashford has been incredibly ineffective, one-dimensional, and quite honestly, holds more attacks than he helps. His performances have come under even more scrutiny because of his poor decision making. Oftentimes you'll see Rashford opt to take on three defenders instead of just going for the simple pass. Of his 26 shots in the Premier League this season, 15 of them have been blocked. There's also a lot of fans calling for him to be benched because of his selfishness, but I'm not really sure if there's anyone that could replace him right now. Alejandro Garnacho is like a firecracker whenever he comes on, but I don't know if he's necessarily ready to be a starter consistently. I think in the long run though, Rashford will get back to normal, especially when he starts being more familiar with his new striking partner, Rasmus Hoyland. But it isn't just the attack, United's defense has also been underperforming. They finished with the third best defense last season, and right now they have the ninth worst defense. Things are only probably going to get worse in the defense because recently Lisandro Martinez was reported out for the next three months. And it really doesn't help that since United couldn't acquire a new quality defender, their next best options are Victor Lindelof, Harry Maguire, and Johnny Evans. It ain't looking good. Speaking of injuries, United so far has suffered the most of anyone else. It's even come to a point that the club had no natural left back available, so they had to play Sofian Amrabat as a left back. I can't believe I almost forgot to talk about Andre Onana because he's been awful this season for Manchester United. Nothing has summed up his season so far more than his disastrous showing in United's loss to Galatasaray recently. It's really odd because last season Onana was statistically the best keeper in the Champions League. It just seems like the pressure has gotten to him or something. Thing. It, it's honestly kind of odd. Needless to say, things are not going so well for United. It's really hard to tell how United will deal with this situation, but considering they're always on this pattern of good season, bad season, good season, bad season, we're in the bad season part of the uh, United cycle. So honestly, just expect the same thing. You got players that are just not really in the right form. Casemiro is right now actually doing quite well, so maybe that rubs off the rest of the team, who knows. But with all the injuries and Probably more to come, it definitely doesn't help. But it doesn't even compare to what is happening off the pitch. That That is just a shambles. Manchester United as a team, not so great right now. Manchester United as a club, irredeemable. But we'll just have to see for the rest of the season. Maybe a video from yours truly will create another jinx, who knows. But of course, a massive shout out to all our patrons, including Janos Bala, Stin, Milioe009, Anazir Makalankam, Aldipu, Alex Rod, Anaya20, Arisan, Chris Damaseno, Daniel Ortiz, Francisco Hernandez, Hysteria, Elea, Joao Carvalho, Josh Budd, Marco Fujimoto, Miguel Munoz, My Man, Return Fire, Rory Burns, Slider Kid, Sniffers, Taco Okafan, Tana Permilia, Celine Khan, Tomicus, Victor, A1KLCF, Chris Visconti, Dominic Griffin, Lewis, Joe Paricio, Lucian Von Kreutz, Michael Nista, Niche, Patrick Barley, Rowan Cookie, Sylvia Citrus, subscribe to Tendaytem, Unbroken Persona, and Valencia for if you'd like to join the Patreon, there'll be a link down below and up in the annotations. You can follow my Twitter if you want, follow my Instagram if you like, follow my TikTok. No follower goal, really. And of course, you can follow my semi-active Twitch. But until then, I'll see you guys.